This is Bewilderbeasts, an infotainment show dedicated to inspiring curiosity for all ages by investigating the ways animals intersect at humanity. I am not a historian, an ethologist, a researcher, a scientist, a zoologist, a trained audio engineer, or an expert in, well, anything. Y'all, I'm lucky if I can remember to put my clean laundry in the dryer before it gets funky. And while I make every effort to present things as accurately as I can with a fun flair, I'm going to mess up. And that's okay. I hope I've given you a nice place to jump off from on your own adventures into curiosity. Or at the very least, I've given you the key to win your next round of trivia. Hello and welcome to Bewilder Beasts. I'm your host, Melissa McHugh McGrath, still recording from the tiniest podcast studio closet outside of Boston, Massachusetts. Today on Bewilder Beasts, we are going to talk about some chickens who went rogue and changed Hollywood. Okay, let's go. everyone. After last week's pigeon episode, I really wanted to do something a little more lighthearted and fun this week. So today's episode was inspired by reading a fantasy collection by my boy Sir Terry Pratchett. He's been discussed mostly out of my adoration for the Discworld series, but how one of his books, Small Gods, was inspired by the story of Aeschylus, the flying turtle who killed a guy, but not just any guy, the father of Greek tragedy and the father of, you know, trilogies. Whoopsie. Well, we covered that back in episode 28. If you're having difficulty finding it, it's called, aptly, The Flying Turtle Who Killed a Guy. Anywho, Terry Pratchett had released a collection of short stories before his death in 2015. And I was reading one of these short stories, which was inspired by the story I'm going to tell you in today's episode. So thank you, Sir Terry, for everything. And speaking of thanks, the biggest of big thanks, gratitude, and forever hugs goes on to Patreon supporters who allow me to keep making this show and pay hosting fees. This week, big ups to my friend Richard Huang. He's supporting this show at the $10 a month level, and he's in a private group right now all by himself on Reddit, so hopefully we can get him some friends. (laughs) Um, He also gets bonus episodes that everyone who donates at a dollar a month can get. He can pick a show topic, which will come out soon, and he got a letter of support for any animal he wanted. Basically, the mom, I want a pony level and a sticker. And to see Richard's name pop up to support this show literally meant the world to me. See, while we were both in and near Oberlin at the same time, it wasn't until I moved to Boston that we met and my life is much better knowing that he's there. So Richard, mwah. I love you forever, and the world is better with you in it. Thank you so much for supporting this show, and to all the supporters who have tossed money at this thing, I cannot thank you enough. If you want to support and get my undying gratitude and stuff, like bonus episodes, ask me anything, whatever you want, go to patreon.com slash bewilderbeastpod and see what works for you. And check that out while you're listening to today's show. One that I just had so much fun writing, I had to move it up by six weeks in production because, y'all, these chickens are, well, you know what? I'm just going to let you figure it out on your own. Let's do this thing. Okay, so let's start this story in the way back machine. All the way back. In the summer of 69... I mean, picture it. Brian Adams, lightly mulleted hair, blaring on and on about the year he got his first six string. Probably some other things. Rupert Murdoch had purchased the news of the world. Richard Nixon was sworn in as president of the United States. The Beatles took that famous photo of them crossing Abbey Road, and later the same year, John Lennon announced he was leaving the band. Whoopsie. The Manson murders. The first ATM machine in the United States. Scooby-Doo aired its first episode. Monty Python first aired. And Dave Grohl, Patton Oswalt, Peter Dinklage, and Jason Bateman were all born. But as far as this show is concerned, 
one event sticks out more than any other, an incident involving a whole lot of chickens. In 1969, there was a rollover on the 101 in Hollywood. I'm not from California, so I will just have to take everyone's word on it that this is a highway. <laughs> this truck happened to be carting chickens heading to the slaughterhouse when a car driver cut off a truck driver. The truck up and flipped. There was an egg explosion. I'm so sorry. And commotion. Eggs were smashed everywhere. Birds were just <laughs> clucking and probably strutting because chickens. Can't blame them. It was either go back to the truck or run into the brush by the on-ramp. So they flew the coop. The driver of the truck, after literally flipping the birds, ran after the nearly 200 freed flock. And these frisky feathers became the freeway chickens. Now, I've never been to L.A., but my understanding is that the traffic is unbearable. And I'm from Boston, so that's going to be telling you something. So the chickens, now free-ranging it on the freeway, are providing some sort of entertainment to the commuters. The Times' T.W. McGarry wrote, quote, Chickens have a slim repertoire of amusing antics, but it doesn't take much to distract someone inching up the Cuyahenga Pass at 2.2 miles per hour. And as these things tend to do, it inspired people to do right by the highway chickens. One resident started feeding them through a chain link fence, and of course she became colloquially known as, and this is a stretch, Chicken Lady. She spent $30 of her own social security money to feed and water the chickens every month. In today's money, that's like a bajillion dollars. Actually, it's 210 that's a significant chunk of money, especially if that's your only way to survive. But the city even begged her to stop feeding the chickens, which she did for like 48 hours. She said that she could see them coming to the fence thirsty, their little tongues out. She had to help them, and since they weren't being lured away, she did what she did best. Just fed and watered the little pluckers. And more and more people started discussing these birds. Guys, there was even a video game inspired by the highway chickens. In 1982, the video game Freeway, according to the LA Times, challenged players to test their cunning and courage by helping your daredevil chicken across the freeway. It's like a feathery version of Frogger. Actress Jody Mann even wrote a script about the freeway chickens. I mean, it was the 70s. Though, I mean, cats, that was a thing, right? And we had butthole CGI drama, and that was recent. So, all right, the 70s, sorry for the shade. Back to actress Jody Mann. She wanted Jessica Tandy to play Minnie, the woman who fed the chickens. Her playing a chicken? would have made me very uncomfortable. But for those who don't know Jessica Tandy, she was also in Alfred Hitchcock's The Birds. So that actually would have been a very weird and satisfying full circle had this movie been made. The movie didn't go anywhere. Minnie was approaching 90 years old, and in 1976, she finally gave permission for animal control to collect the chickens from the state highway, which was not Minnie's jurisdiction. But I guess animal control was really listening to her as for all things guidance on the chickens. Minnie said, yes, animal control, come take these chickens, ship them off to a farm. My understanding? It was a real farm and not that farm. So while that should have been the end of the tale, it wasn't. We still have five pages to go. Eight years later, after the near flightless featherin were frisked away to a farmyard, everyone thought, hey, remember when those chickens lived by the freeway? Those were the days. But highway patrol officers saw upwards of a half a dozen ninja chickens pecking at some stale Twinkies on the highway. The California Department of Transportation spokeswoman said after the chickens were rediscovered in the 80s in the same spot, I'm guessing in a very uncomfortable way standing in front of a Four Seasons landscaping, quote, we didn't get them all back in 1976. I guess they're like rabbits. Get all but two and you're still in trouble. Well, I'd wager someone should explain to her that having two opposite sex of any animal might lead to trouble. <coughs> Ms. Spokeswoman, when a boy chicken loves a girl chicken very much, he takes her to a pile of highway litter and makes baby highway chickens. 
See, there are two competing theories depending on which one you'd like to believe as to how the chickens reemerged after eight years. One, the Times T.W. McGarry. Remember him? Analyzing why the chicks were the best highway entertainment because we weren't distracted by phones on the dashboard yet? Well, he thought that we, and this is his quote, weeded out all the dumb clucks, end quote. And the fastest, fittest, friskiest chickens were left to create an uber chicken, a generation of the craftiest, cluckiest, pluckiest chickens in the history of chickendom. <laughs> or two, animal control story is that they absolutely, without a doubt, 1,000% got all the chickens. And they were all captured. Certain. No doubt. We think. Some people just must have let chickens go into the fenced area by the highway to mess with animal control and the sensible people on the 101. This is a chicken conspiracy. But, according to the Deseret News, quote, What was called the Great Freeway Chicken Roundup of the approximately 50 Rhode Island Reds, only four were caught in four hours by an embarrassed team of animal control. The animals who were considered dumb fowl were smart enough to realize that the chicken feed scattered like Hansel and Gretel's breadcrumbs into cages was maybe, in the infamous words of Colonel Akbar, a trap. Perhaps overly confident, the Animal Regulation Department commented that this could take a few days, longer than perhaps initially thought because these chickens are smart, wild, and comfortable in their new highway habitat, but that there was more than one way to coax a chicken. What other ways are there? Did the ACO who drew the short straw dress up as Foghorn Leghorn? Cluck, cluck, cluck. Hey, ladies. No one here but us chickens. Right? Uh, cluck? Or maybe a white van that said free chicken candy pulls up because, you know, the 70s and California highways. I have no idea what was meant by more than one way to coax a chicken. A skillet? Anyway. 1990 rolls around. This is now 21 years after the initial rollover. We have the beginnings of grunge, flannel everything, and bangs for days, and they are still not going anywhere. Reports of chickens roaming a different stretch of the Hollywood Freeway near a different on-ramp, Burbank Boulevard. This is about two miles north of the crash. And to my understanding, about six hours by car. Apparently, these were dubbed the new freeway chickens because Hollywood and sequels are a thing. And the idea of a sequel just really tickles me. So let's have some fun. Chicken 2, the chickening. Live free or die over hard. Look who's plucking now. Too fast, too featherous. Cluck and cluckerer. Chicken Run 2, the great highway chicken. Hot Chicks Part 2, which would have actually had for sure bad ratings because people probably wouldn't be expecting chickens. So chickens have a lifespan of about 10 years. Around the time of maybe failed, maybe successful 1976 roundup, which was for sure not successful, a scientist commented that he couldn't understand how the freeway chickens could be so healthy after all those years living in exhaust fumes. Well, we've all seen Marvel movies, right? While the weaker chickens certainly died from inhaling highway fumes, a few select drank radioactive car exhaust and became some sort of ultra chicken, surviving forever, solving crime. But those chickens also left, and the myth just started to really take off the ground, unlike the chickens. Because chickens. Maybe the new chickens were local. Maybe there never was a truck overturned. Though there were at least witnesses to the event. And maybe the chickens were afraid of a new dog in the residence, flew the coop, and escaped to a freeway. And likely because they heard tales of the brave highway chickens of years long ago, they knew exactly where to go where they could rough it. Bear grill style, but for chickens on a median. Stories of people saying, quote, Well, we had to save our chickens, so we dumped them as kids by the pillowcase full near the site so they wouldn't be eaten. And my new rescue dog scared my chickens and they took off for the 101. <coughs> All of these anecdotes started to pop up explaining the new chickens. The chicken sequel. The chickening. Which might be true. These anecdotes might explain why some of the chickens appeared healthier given the area, the highway, the noise, the pollution, the all-twinkie diet. And it might also explain why back in the 70s during the initial rollover, the driver said, well, they were all lady chickens. Which, unless they were knocked up when they flew the coop, a rooster is kind of a necessary part of the equation to make baby chickens. 
But in 2009, KNXAM 1070, traffic reporter Jeff Bow reported that chickens were back, baby. They were observed along the 5 freeway in Newhall Pass near its junction with the 14. I have no idea where that is. It's apparently north of the OG accident and Chicken Run 2, the sequel. Do you know what this means? It's a three quill. Yep, the best trilogy of all time. Take that, Lord of the Rings, Star Wars, and Jason Bourne. Yeah. Thanks, Aeschylus. So, we got your Chicken Impossible 3, Poultry of the Caribbean 3, X Hen 3, The Naked Hen 33 and a third, and The God Cockerel Part 3. To double check this piece, I, of course, went to Snopes because, I mean, you were there, you heard this story. Not only is it true, there are elements that led themselves nicely to the myth, meaning that another 200 years from now, we might have an entire story on King Clucker, who was the only rooster to somehow pull a magic sword from a freeway barricade and lead his flock to safety thanks to the help of Chick-In, a magician, and the Lady of the Interstate. Oh, and Sir Gawain, because I couldn't come up with a good pun. But yes, Snopes confirms that this story is totally true. And not only that... Here is a list of other things found on the freeway. Think Snopes. In 1982, about $7,000 worth of quarters on the Hollywood freeway. Motorists jumping in front of cars reportedly to get away with about 10% of the loot. This would be over $19,000 today. March 26, 1986, thousands of pounds of M&M candies on Orange Freeway in Fullerton. Surprisingly, no motorists attempt to scoop up any. One body on a Hollywood freeway from the back of a coroner's van. Whoops. Hundreds of gallons of laughing gas on the Foothill freeway. Turns out no one really cared about the traffic or really anything that day. (laughs) One 26-ton boat on Culver Boulevard for 36 hours. 14,000 pounds of salts on Interstate 5 in San Clemente. No guac, no sour cream, no chips. Worst Taco Tuesday ever. 40,000 bees on Foothill Freeway. It's so chilly that the bees didn't attack anyone. More than a thousand jugs of wine on the Golden State Freeway. Yay! Crews had to keep motorists away. No kidding. One actress's resume. Hair, honey blonde, eyes, hazel blue on the Foothill Freeway. Stampeding cattle. Pianos. Mayonnaise of unknown quantity. Ew. Broken watermelons. Banana. Hot asphalt, which, I mean, highway, right? Shouldn't that be normal? Soft drinks. Margarita mix, which is weirdly unrelated to the salsa incident. Tomatoes. Beer. 150 tons of honey. Unrelated to the unaggressive cold bees. A wild boar's head. A five-foot-tall paper mache rhinoceros because... Why not? A U.S. Navy depth charge, which I looked up. Y'all, this is a bomb on a highway, an anti-submarine warfare weapon. It is intended to destroy a submarine by being dropped into the water nearby and detonating, subjecting the target to a powerful and destructive hydraulic shock. What? Sides of beef. Mannequins. What highway hasn't had a good mannequin on it? And I would say the least weird thing on this list, a dead 15-foot, 2,000-pound great white shark. It's L.A. I'm sure he was en route to an audition. He's fine, and he had a great movie career. Though I do have to laugh, because five of the six resources from that Snopes article were from the same guy I got my source from, Steve Harvey. I'm guessing it's not that Steve Harvey. But then again, I have no idea what's real anymore. Wikipedia had a list of 12 references, including the other outlets like the Bangor Daily News all the way up in Maine and the Deseret News from Salt Lake. So next time you see a chicken just chickening, minding her own business, give them a knowing nod because you don't know if that chicken is really a descendant of Hollywood highway royalty.
So thank you for joining me today on Bewilderbeasts. If you like this podcast, you can still share and tell all your friends. Please do. It's truly the best way to support the show. But if you want even more content, check out patreon.com slash bewilderbeasts. For supporting the show at a dollar, you get bonus episodes and a shout out on the show. I love hearing from all of you. It makes me realize that y'all are out there and listening. So if you want to know how to connect with the show, don't be shy. Here's how. If there are topics that you would be interested in hearing about on the podcast, know of any historical animals who change the world, animals who help humans, wacky animals are in the news, or other farm life just chilling in unusual habitats, send them to the show. There are multiple ways to send them in or let me know what you think. Email bewilderbeastpod at gmail.com. I read and respond to every email. Tweet a bewildered pod. DM or voice text on bewilderbeastpod on Facebook or lurk at bewilderbeast on Instagram. I'm Melissa McHugh McGrath, author of Considerations for the City Dog and creator of this podcast. Now go get curious. I got today's information from the LA Times, Snopes.com, Wikipedia.org on both Hollywood Freeway Chickens and Jessica Tandy, the Deseret News, the Bangor Daily News, and Snopes.com. Intro music is Tiptoe Out the Back by Dan Leibowitz, and interstitial music is by MK2. Links, as always, are in the description of today's episode. Now, don't forget, like, subscribe, review, and share with your curious friends. You know, all the things every other podcast tells you to do. Thanks for listening, and I will see you whenever you want. Just go to bewilderbeastpod.com for instant gratification, or just wait till next week. Bye.